Awesome. Well, part two here with uh, with Jordan. We uh, we had a, a really great chat on Friday and had to cut things short uh, as our schedules didn't permit. But looping back here for our second chat, uh, our, our our first question here that we're gonna kind of dig into and tackle with Jordan uh, is Jordan is currently uh, the North American Accommodation Specialist with Electronic Arts. He's previously the North American Wellbeing Manager, and in our previous chat just on Friday, we talked about um, you know the challenges that people who have like physical disabilities or, or different challenges in terms of entering the workforce or succeeding in the workforce are faced with. And uh, you know, we tied those into the three different pillars that I often talk about: the you know, a company having a vision, a mission, a culture, a value system, and living those things. Uh, I often call that pillar two, but really to me, it's almost pillar one of a successful hire and retention strategy. Obviously, the next piece to hire and retain people is that recruitment strategy, whether you use an agency or not. And then we talk about that third piece, that intangible of like, you know, helping people and dealing with people and preventing, you know, preventable turnover due to maybe factors outside of the company's control or factors that could be in their control that maybe aren't necessarily their responsibility and seeing a role like this that Jordan has at a company I, like I still don't necessarily know if it's their responsibility but it's something that they've decided to make their responsibility I'm assuming from a employee retention and engagement from a recruitment strategy to make sure they're doing everything they can to keep and to identify and hire amazing people so Jordan could you uh, maybe tell me more about like your role uh, as an accommodation specialist and, and how you feel it ties into those those kind of pillars as I define them yeah, thanks, Brent, and I, and I appreciate that. Um, you know, there's a, there's quite a few pieces here. Part of it is there's the 1984 ADA Act, which requires any employers that have 15 or more employees need to be willing to um, have an employer request for accommodation if they have a qualifying medical condition or disability. And, and, you know, by definition, that is something that, that would limit them in their daily function. So does the person have a mobility issue? Do they have a learning uh, disability? Do they have um, a, a, an emotional or mental health disability that, that may distract them throughout the day? And so employers are obligated to do this. Now, of course, there's multiple ways you can do it. You can do the Band-Aid approach and do the minimum that's asked, or you can truly look at it and say, you know what? We want to have the right people in the right role with the right skill set. And are we able to reach all those people? And can we actually hold on to those people? So in my role, what I do is I get to work with our employees. So the moment that one of our employees says, I'm struggling and it's related to this disability or this health condition, or I'm finding I can't perform at the level I want to because of a qualifying disability or condition. I get to what is uh, referred to as the interactive process. I get to engage them in that. And what that is, that's information gathering that will allow us to determine, okay, does this person have a qualifying condition? Okay, if yes, then what would they require to, to be the best version of themselves? And, and how, how can Electronic Arts and myself make sure that we level set that employee with their colleagues? Because if we're not willing to be able to lift a person to an equal level as those who they work with, how can we ask them to perform at that same level? And so we want to ensure that we're allowing all of our employees to be the best version of themselves, no matter whether they do or do not have a, a medical condition or disability. We just, we want people to be the best you. Yeah. How, how, like, if there was a spectrum on, on, when I say the least someone can do, I don't mean that the company's purposely doing the least they could do, but like, you know, certain companies have, you know, bigger abilities to accommodate someone than others. What's well, some of like maybe the smaller things that you've seen the company do that have been really impactful? And then, you know, I, I guess part of it could even go into like coaching people on their team to better understand how, you know, how 
to support this person depending on what they have like is there kind of like the you know the, the macro and the micro so to speak of like what you've seen or what you guys have done yeah great question brent and, it, and it's interesting because the moment a lot of companies hear accommodation or they're hiring someone who may need an accommodation right away they start thinking about oh my gosh what's this gonna cost us right well an accommodation could be as simple as moving someone's desk to a quieter area in the office because they may have challenges concentrating. It could be providing a parking stall closer to the building that mobility issues um, due to medication and treatment, they may need to start at nine o'clock instead of eight o'clock. So there's a lot of accommodations that truly don't cost the company anything and the return on putting that accommodation in place is huge because now you've met the employee where you needed to meet them, you have elevated them to an equal status as their colleagues. And now you have said, we want you to perform at the best you can. And that's empowering your employee and that's gonna make them feel as though they're welcomed and they belong. You know, and, and there are some accommodations that definitely can become a lot more, you know, costly. Um, you know, some of those could be getting into, you know, some of your assistive technologies, some of your different word to speak programs. Uh, it could be setting up a, a complete new workstation for someone. And, and in some cases, if that person doesn't have the ability to work from home, it may be, you know, removing some form of ob obstacle or barrier that limits the employee coming into the office, you know, and, and they're all different levels and there are different ways that you can implement them. You know, if you're a small employer and, and you don't have the financial means to be able to remove a barrier, well, you also are allowed to request a, a different accommodation that would still provide the employee with the end result that they need. Um, larger companies, of course, you know, when you look at a lot of the larger tech companies, very, very difficult for us to claim a new hardship because the accommodation may cost us a few thousand dollars. Right. You know, if you're a 15 employee, you know, small private family company, that $2,000 could be big. And so there, there are um, ways that not only protect the employee, but there's also ways that protect the employer as well. Like we wanna make sure that, that undue hardship isn't created for anyone in this process. And it's really just ensuring that we're all able to be again, the best version of ourselves. Right. This, this maybe isn't specific to like EA, but more maybe, you know, what you've experienced or what you've seen inside, outside the company, but as part of like an accommodation specialist role, again, whether with or without the company is, would part of that be, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to make the question, let's say about someone in a wheelchair, like yourself, I've never worked with someone in a wheelchair and I assume there isn't anything that you need for me other than maybe holding the door for you sometime or something like that. But you talked about all sorts of different spectrums of needs of different people. Does there ever become like an educational piece from the company to the employees on how to like accommodate that other employee or how to best support them or whether it's teams high level, like, is that a part of it or is it more the individual what do we need to help you show up like I guess how far does it go you know and and I think it's a combination of everything because what we're finding is we can put the accommodation in place but if the manager the team the company doesn't understand why that's needed what that will provide um, how can they support it well you're kind of only putting it halfway in place yeah. You know, but if but if you provide the manager with the education and the understanding as to what is an accommodations job, um, how can you evaluate if that accommodation is effective or not effective, and how can you be looking at additional ways to support that employee? Yeah. You know, for instance, if an employee um, has a a learning disability and they require that everything is in written form because it's easier for them to retain it 
Well, if you start to implement that practice on a, on a wider scale, well, now you're going to be not only supporting that employee, but other employees who may have a, a similar condition or disability. Um, you also now are changing a mindset of how you deliver information to everybody. Um, and really, that's part of it is to, you know, start to understand that we all learn and we all retain and we all do things on, on different spectrums and in different types of environments. So if we can educate our managers, educate our colleagues on ensuring that we are doing the, the portion of our job in as many ways as possible on as many platforms as possible, we're meeting people in a, in a much better place. You know, it's no longer the, you know, that one and done approach. It's like, oh, well, I did it this way and you all can fend for yourself. Yeah. You know, why would we do that? Why would we not reach out and, and allow our employees to understand that there are multiple ways to still get to that desirable end result? Yeah. Well, I wonder, I mean, I find it highly valuable for me through this program to connect with people that are part of massive companies that have the resources to do all these things because even if there's a little you know a little grain of sand or something that a company can grab onto that it can be a massive catalyst for change and i wonder if you know it was that company with say less than 15 employees or maybe they've got 30 whatever that number may be you know what what would your i guess like suggestion be to, I guess, an employer to, like, I guess, better understand, better support their team? Like, is there, you know, without having someone like you there, is there a place like you've gone to get like resources and information? Like how, how would say me as an employer, how would I go to better educate myself and figure out how we could support somebody coming in, you know, that needs that outside of, of, like you said, let's say moving a parking space or moving a desk. That's great. You know, but like you said, if that's only me going halfway, how do I go the full way without you know, having the, somebody like you there? Yeah. The positive side now is the amount of information available online is, is huge. You know, if there, there's information that you'll probably never get to. There's so much available. Um, there is a site which is the Job Accommodation Network, uh, JAN, and they actually go in and they list disabilities A to Z, and they right. also provide you with what are some potential uh, accommodations that would work. And then there, there's lots of simple things as well that you can do to start getting not only yourself and, and your team thinking about it that costs you nothing, you know, yeah. things such as when you're in a Zoom meeting, do you turn on the closed captioning or do you not? When you're putting out uh, communications, are you taking into account accessibility in those? And are you utilizing what's available? You know, because now if you look at Adobe, you look at Microsoft, you look at Apple, all of these companies, if you take those few moments to find it, all have accessibility links to them. And they not only help you define whether or not what you're providing is accessible, but they help you actually implement it directly into your day every single day. Right. So the, the biggest thing anyone can do is to think about accessibility and everything that we do. And if we do that, we will naturally start being driven to all of these resources and and all of these platforms that really the, the only thing they cost you is a little bit of time yeah. um, to go in and and actually learn and to um, activate them right yeah that's really interesting um, I suppose part of it too would be uh, you know, unless it's like newly discovered for somebody that if it's something that they've, you know, I guess that's been a part of them for a while, they likely would also bring some resources. And then I guess, you know, outside of those like initial accommodation needs, like, again, I guess where I'm trying to like go wrapping my head around it is for someone like myself, where, uh, again, if I wanted to take that step of not just accommodating them, but also making sure that, you know, I guess the team is informed that that those resources, you said it was Jan, yeah. 
Yeah. And I'm sure there's many others, but then ultimately, I guess it just comes down to like, I guess when that situation becomes prevalent, you kind of look and, and kind of go down that path. Uh, my last question for you on the topic would be, you talked about uh, the kind of initial like headspace that an employer potentially goes to when they first learn of, of you know, somebody needing accommodation and how the initial kind of mindset is like, what is this going to cost me? You know, I assume that's very much like, you know, the hard cost and soft cost piece of 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 that is there a way you th- to you, you think to to try to you know like narrow that kind of that that bridge like a way to kind of shift that mindset that you know that that it's i think obviously that fear of loss that cost investment is one of the first places we go it's natural human nature um i know we talked about some of the value the path the hard work that a lot of these people have had to go through to be equal um but just wondering if anything else comes to mind in terms of like how we can kind of shift that mindset of anybody when you know they first hear or see and how you know maybe automatically the mind goes to like what is this going to cost time effort energy dollars versus like another way of looking at it and 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 maybe that further value that one could perceive or, or gain from from going down the path you know, and I, I wish there was an easy answer to this um, because, you know, when we look at those, those unconscious bias that, that we all face, um, you know, the, the only thing that will help to improve that is for us to challenge our own way of thinking. Yeah. You know, and, and we need to ensure that, that we are taking that on and willing to take that on every single day. Um, I had this great conversation with, with my daughter. She's five years old and we were, you know, out at a park and a person was, was acting differently than what she actually thought someone should act like. And she looked at me and she said, oh my gosh, daddy, look at that crazy person. And I was like, oh, okay, well, you know what, sweetie? I go, maybe that person is just trying to act silly and and maybe that person is just acting differently than what you might do you think we should call them crazy and it's such an interesting thing because a five-year-old can grasp the idea that crazy may not be the right word or the right term to use Right. So if someone who hasn't developed the ability yet to make that determination can understand what that word or what that thought may mean, there's really no reason why we as adults should be making the judgments and, and coming to the conclusions that we do sometimes without investing equal time into understanding if it's fact. Mm. And, you know, it's really, we have to challenge ourselves, fact or fiction. We have to do it every day. You know, when I first lost my leg, everyone either assumed I was in the military or I was a diabetic and I didn't take care of myself. And it's, and it's such an interesting thing because when you look at it, it's like, yeah, of course, both of those things can, can cause someone to lose a leg. But people naturally didn't go to, is it cancer related? Is it an infection? Was it a motor vehicle accident? Was it a workplace accident? Like all these other possibilities, we have to challenge ourselves to put on the brakes when we're coming to a thought that it's an uneducated thought. Right. And you can see, I get a little bit uh, passionate and emotional about that because I was you know, someone with a disability, I am amazed throughout my day, how many uh, improper thoughts uh, people come to when they first see you. For sure. Yeah. I wonder how, um, where would you, where would you start? How do you start to affect change? Well, I guess the, the, the big thing for me is, and, and, it's, and I love how, you know, sort of transparent you, you were when you talked about working with someone in a wheelchair, you know, and it's like, you know, I, I, I don't think I, I've, I've had that need yet. Well, the question is then is, is that because 
you haven't put yourself out there in a way that somebody in a wheelchair would reach out to you? Is it that you haven't put yourself in an environment to, to allow someone in a wheelchair reach out? Or is it just the fact no one has? Right. And so for me, my, I always challenge myself and other people with disabilities in the sense of, are we taking those moments of, of unconscious bias and using them as, as teaching moments? Because if we're not doing that, then we are equally to blame. And are our friends, our family, our colleagues, are they being open and are they allowing themselves to, to show as an ally to someone with a disability um, that they are safe? Right. And so, you know, I, I think there's, there has to be accountability by both people on both sides, you know, and it's funny because people that have disabilities, a lot of times they're exhausted, they're tired, they're frustrated, but we can't use that as an excuse. It's just right. like, we can't allow an employer to say, oh, well, yeah, we don't have automatic doors, but we've never had anyone, you know, work here in a wheelchair, so we haven't needed them. Well, if I'm not willing to take the time to educate you and you're not willing to take the time to implement what may be needed, we're both to blame. Yeah. As it ties really well into the next piece we're going to talk about, which is like the, the disconnect between job seekers and businesses. I think, you know, the, the like initial piece, just to kind of close things off on this, that kind of comes to mind is, I mean, people get emails all the time and read the first sentence and not really go deep into it. And I think it's maybe that mindset of like, how long is it going to take me to get the information I need to at least be able to take steps? You know, is it a paragraph? Is it a video? Is it an article? Or do I need to spend 10 hours, you know, to get educated? And, you know, I think, you know, I think like you said, if, if, you first need someone who's like willing and open, but maybe also need somebody who's, you know, ready to go, you know what, here's, here's a bit of a roadmap for you. And it's really not as bad as you think, you know, like, but I guess it's, it's first needing that situation of, of, you know, where it becomes, you know, parent and it's in your face. So that's tough. Cause then it, you know, to me, it still seems like there's a barrier that would make it hard for somebody to like get to that stage. And, you know, obviously the, the hope of this conversation would be to, you know, to try to find ways to minimize that as much as possible. I mean, again, we talk about the, the market, how hard it is to find people and, you know, how, how as we discussed in our first part, how, you know, someone who's, you know, a marketing manager, someone who's an accountant or someone who's whatever they may be. And if they've had developmental disabilities or physical disabilities, how much harder of the path has been for them to be equal and how much, I don't know if it's fair to quantify or say how much of a better or worse employee, like, I don't think any of that's fair, but again, if someone had to work that much harder to be equal, like how are they going to show up? Right. And, and I would argue that they would show up just with as much effort as it took them to be equal and that you're likely, you know, again, I, I don't know if it's right to say a better employee, but again, you're, you're not going to end up with not as good of an employee, right? If anything, again, someone who's maybe got, you know, adversities they've gone through and, and a different work ethic and tenacity and all these things. So like, I just think it's even more critical, which is, and obviously, you know, I'd argue, can't speak for yay, but I'd argue they'd feel the same way given they've got someone like you in the role that you're in, where they're seeing the value and importance of investing in that, which to me goes, okay, again, as a small business, they maybe can't afford, you know, if someone's paying attention to this to bring someone in like you, but that doesn't mean they can't take snips of this and go, okay, you know, maybe this is a great opportunity for us to do something that our competition isn't. How do we open our doors? How do we come become more inclusive to maybe find that next like differentiator for their organization? Um, and maybe someone's out there, you know, waiting for that role and just either feeling there's barriers, you're not looking for those opportunities because they feel like the path to get there is going to be too hard and there's a way to kind of bridge that gap. Well, and I think a big piece of it is be willing to have the conversation, you yeah. know, and, and as you talked about, it's like for someone who has a disability, you know, it's, it's probably fairly safe to assume that, that it has taken them more effort to get to the door than it did someone who doesn't have that disability. Yeah. 
So why not at least at a minimum be open and willing to have the conversation as to what they needed to get to the door? And is there something that could have been provided to help to make that, and I don't want to say easier because we shouldn't look at at this in a case of what does someone with a disability need to make it easier yeah. or of is there something that would have created a better experience and allowed you to be a more authentic you that we could have done right because for me you know when i when i first lost my light the learning curve was huge and i very quickly learned what worked what didn't work and then when i recently ended up in the wheelchair I again had to very quickly learn like what works and what doesn't work. And so if someone said to me, hey, what do you need to be able to get you to your desk? Uh, I can pretty safely be able to give them multiple alternatives. So maybe our first step should be as employers, let's start be willing to ask the question and let's take the information given to us and build from it. And if we can do that, you know what, we're, we're already going in a great direction that, you know, potentially is going to support everyone. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, it ties super well into uh, the last topic we were going to discuss. We, you know, we talked about those three pillars and having like the, you know, the vision, the mission, the culture, the values, a great employee experience, all these things. And then that third pillar of, of um, you know, the, the inclusivity and, you know, I had a, another gentleman, Ken on, who's a behavioral analyst who deals with disc assessments to help uh, employers speak better to one another. Uh, you recently introduced me to a friend of yours who's actually uh, agreed to have our interaction recorded. So we'll be launching our discussion. Uh, he is, his unemployed right now. Uh, it, was, it was Randy who you referred over to me. And I think it's great because Randy is a, a former executive who's come on hard times. He is a job seeker that's struggling through the process. And one of the things that our, you know, webcast is about is trying to like bridge those gaps. And I think Randy, I mean, I've been doing this for 10 years. I've talked to many, many people who are well, 12 years, many, many people who are unemployed, uh, who have either, you know, left a job and vacated from a position new to the workforce, new to the country, whatever it may be. And Randy totally struck me as the time as the kind of guy who uh, was owning his story. He'd been trying to find something for years. And his whole purpose of connecting with me wasn't to, you know, to, to share a sob story, to point the finger to anybody. He wanted a harsh look in the mirror. He wanted to know what he could do better. He wanted to know what he could do differently. I thought that was great. And it also reminded me of when you and I first connected and I want to share this story because I think it's such an awesome story, but you previously worked at Riders Eyewear. We had a mutual friend who was the office manager there, Jeanette, who had introduced us. And again, as the owner of Express, we, we, we offered staffing solutions that uh, aligned with some of the needs that you guys had as the operations manager. And I remember showing up five or 10 minutes early to the meeting, waiting in my car outside in the parking lot and just looking up info on you, who I was going to be meeting with to just get a little bit more informed. And uh, in that five to 10 minutes came across the story that writers had posted on their website about how you know you'll have to explain the story further but how you know years before we met you you had a situation that happened something happened with your leg next thing you know I don't know if it's five years later you've had 60 surgeries you've lost that leg you're competing uh in in you know in bike races against able-bodied individuals and I walked into that meeting we sat down and I remember just being like Jordan I know we're here to talk shop and talk business and for me to sell my company I'm like but I don't care. I don't want to do any of that. I don't care if I leave here without getting anything from you guys. I just think your story is like super inspiring and I want to learn more. Uh, and again, we'll tie this into why I feel it's important for the job seeker and how this ties in. But would you mind kind of sharing your story a bit more and giving some more context to the audience and uh, of what you went through, even up till now, obviously, with the recent transitions? Yeah, thank you. I, you know what? It's... Uh... It, it, it's always great when people learn about me and they can somehow connect with it. Um, you know, the 
sort of, you know, short version of the story is 25 years old, battled cancer. I was a very high level athlete, never drank, never smoked, never did drugs. But for whatever reason, I got faced with cancer. Um, during my cancer, I went to India and was treated by an Ayurvedic doctor. I then came home and used Chinese medicine, practical medicine, and was able to overcome my cancer. Because of that, that left me with a weakened immune system. And because I was competing and racing and doing all these things all over the world at some pretty amazing, amazing places, they believe I got an infection in through a blister on of my foot, which turned to a bone infection, osteomyelitis. And their hope was that if they put me on long-term antibiotics and pain medication and, and surgeries, they could eradicate it fairly quickly and it would be reasonably non-invasive. Um, that turned into over 10 years uh, of them chasing after it. Uh, it was 60 plus surgeries. I had gone into septic comas and it was just a, a very, very challenging time for me. And finally, you know, my doctor said, we can explore amputation, but your life is going to change and, you know, you're not going to be the same and, you know, sort of trying to set you up for, I'm not sure what, it didn't feel like success, but they're trying to set me up for something. And I said, you know what, if it means I don't have to look at my family in the eye anymore, um, when I come to and here they're in a hospital crying because they don't know what's going to happen to me, cut my leg off. Right. They cut my leg off. Um, that led to me competing as a para-athlete. You know, within one year, I raced in the Canadian National Cycling Championships. I've competed in para events and, and non-para events and just really embraced the fact that, you know, my disability wasn't truly a, a disability as many would define it. It was the disability was whether I was going to be willing to learn or not learn how to deal with it. Um, that led to a, a great cycling career, great opportunities, all these things. And then during the pandemic, um, again, someone decided in their wisdom that a pandemic wasn't hard enough. And I all of a sudden lost the ability to functionally stand and walk safely. Um, and it turned in, I was, I've been diagnosed with a, a neurologic condition, which has put me into a wheelchair. Um, and by being in a wheelchair, I now look at a complete other side of being disabled because now mobility, this thing that I fought to, to have as an amputee, I now had to find in a wheelchair. And, you know, uh, the interesting part for me was that I haven't looked at any of this as to what this has taken away from me in my life. I've tried to look at this through the lens of, okay, what is still available to me? And, and what are these things that I'm now being exposed to that I've, I've never you know, been exposed to before? Part of it is, you know, I'm in a wheelchair and does it make me the, the ideal person with what I've gone through to be an accommodation specialist for an amazing company? 100% it has. Would I have been as invested in my role if I wasn't in a wheelchair? I don't know, because I, I only look at things moving forward. I don't look at them moving backwards. So, you know, that, that's why if someone pulls my story out of me, I'm happy to share it. Yeah. Um, because for me, it's just, it's, you know, and I, I, whenever I, I close any off any speaking engagement, I always close it off with, I am love and life is my story. And I, and I believe we all should go through life like that. We should love everything that we're provided today. And we should allow our story and ourselves be our story of life. Right. Um, and if we can embrace that, I, I, I think we'll be in a pretty good spot. Was there any, I mean, through the 60 surgeries, the amputation, the, the, the you know, the, the battling cancer, was there something 
before then that you had that, you know, was your mindset? Did your mindset change over time? I mean, I'm sure there's thousands of people, if not more than that number, who knows what the quantifier is that would go through what you went through and just give up. You know, like, was there, was there a mindset shift you had to go through? Was there like a goal you had in mind? Like, what was it? Was it something that was already there or was it something you had to do? Like, what was it that keeps you kind of fighting through the challenge and the adversity and the battle you're going through? I think it was a combination. I think that, you know, being an athlete when I was young and, and, you know, having people around me who generally, you know, worked pretty hard for everything they had, I think that helped. But, you know, the, the biggest piece for me was accepting how hard it really was and, and, and being willing to, you know, everyone says, oh my gosh, like, wow, I could have never done it. Well, trust me, I had days where I didn't think I could ever do it. Right. You know, so, you know, this story of victory and me getting to here today and everything. Yeah, I didn't have really tough days. And you know what, it's really, um, for me, at least, it was being willing to accept the fact that that day that I'm having where I don't want to continue where, you know, you think, man, my life would be easier if they, if they just took the tube out of me and didn't give me any more medication because I wouldn't hurt anymore. Right. It's being willing to accept and see that, but not make that where you end. You know, it, it's really saying, yes, I'm having a bad day today, but setting limitations. You know, like we don't sit down at a table and just continue to eat and eat and eat. Something tells us that we're full. Mm-hmm. Well, find within yourself what is that thing that tells you that it's time to transition from this could be a moment of sadness or weakness or, or a moment of just feeling completely lost. Make sure you're open to also recognize that shift within yourself. Um, and when you recognize that shift, hang on to it. Don't assume that it's coming back and don't assume that it doesn't have value. It does. It has great value and you need to appreciate it. Yeah. Well, that's why I think like, you know, it can be a tough parallel to, to, to kind of, you know, tie together, but you know, all the things you talk about, whether it was my recent conversation with Randy or with other job seekers, it's those same emotions that a lot of job seekers go through when they've, you know, they've been let go or fired or mass layoffed or, you know, had to leave a, a bad environment or maybe something else altogether that just ended up landing them in a tough spot. And, you know, the process of trying to get a job is difficult and fought with adversity throughout the way. And, you know, I just look at someone like you who, you know, arguably has gone through a significant, significantly harder challenge and yet you still embrace it. You still have a smile on your face. You, you know, you, you, like you said, you look at like what opportunities do I have versus what's been taken away from me. And I really think, you know, some of that disconnect that we sometimes see with job seekers is, you know, that like, you know, the the finger point and, and the unwillingness to kind of be introspective and take, take like your own path in your control and figure out what you're going to do. And it sucks. Like, you know, the whole process is hard resumes and interviewing and rejection. I mean, poor Randy, who we talked about, I mean, I feel one of the things we talked about is how he's almost starting to believe, you know, the, like the, the opposite of hype that he's built up for himself, that he's not worthy. And I could see that he may be like responding to questions in a negative way and not really believing his value and how, you know, you kind of need to like, you know, know what your worth is and what you're trying to accomplish and see the value in yourself and just, I guess, realize that it is a process and it takes time. I almost look at it the same as I'm sure the millions of physio sessions you've had to go through and the workouts and, you know, the same for your job search and just, you know, think that uh, obviously if there's a way to tie that back to, to someone going through that adversity that I'm sure, you know, that, that if they had a choice to, to trade places, they'd probably stay right where they are unemployed fighting for a job. And, uh, you know, that, that obviously there's a lot worse places to be. Not that that's not a great place to be like, or a terrible place to be. I mean, everybody's livelihoods attached to it, right? Like everyone's got to pay their bills, but 
at the end of the day, you know, they just need to keep fighting. And I think your story is really inspirational. And I think if, you know, someone's having a tough time and they, they get inspired from it, or they, you know, they, they go and then take a look at their resume or whatever it may be like, you know, hopefully, hopefully someone who's maybe having a hard time with that can, can get some solves from this and, and realize that there, there's likely a road at the end of that tunnel. And it, you know, doesn't involve an amputation at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's, that's that's always the the big goal, and I, you know, and and I love what you just said there, Brett, because it, it really is that right. It's 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 understanding, you know, what you're looking for, being willing to put in the time and the research, and 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 bring the people around you that you need to make it successful. Yeah. Um, you know, and you know, I, I would argue that you know. We talk about my friend Randy, and I would argue that what he currently is facing, you know, with his job search is is really currently affecting him probably the same way as me facing a lot of the health stuff that I went through affected me because we we all put different levels of importance on different things in our life and at different stages in our life. Um and, you know, if you're a job seeker and that, that job search has gone from three months to six months to a year, you know, recognize the impact that that has on you and recognize that at some point you need to reach out to someone like Brent who is able to look at why that success hasn't been there for you and start to guide you back on the path to where you need to be. Because you know what, we, we only have a limited, you know, energy supply. And the longer something goes on, the tougher it becomes and, and never get caught up in the fact that asking for help is a sign of weakness. And never think that you are the expert of everything because you never are. Yeah. And bring those people in that you need. Because you know, let's be honest, we, the more people you surround yourself with and the better and higher quality of people you surround yourself with, that is going to create that, that, that higher valued experience and outcome for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, nowhere near the same level, but I broke my leg years ago uh, playing hockey and it was a year before I could walk again. So, I mean, it, it was a, a pretty difficult situation to go through, but I would argue, you know, you'd, you'd probably agree. I'm not going to put words in your mouth, but the physical pain is one thing, but when you, you know, you've been mentally beat down and you're maybe not seeing the progress and you're not, not having the success, you're not getting the wins, the, you know, the, 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 you don't see the light at the end of the tunnel and you're just kind of going through the motions. Like, I think that's where people really like struggle and that's where people really get beat down. And I feel like that's kind of where like Randy was, is just, you know, going through it over and over, not seeing the success. And I think, again, that's something that obviously you've gone through probably more than most people. And yet you're, you seem less focused on like the result at the end and more about like just taking another step. And like, whether it's physical pain or whether it's just like overcoming the, the mental piece of saying like, I don't want to take a step because it might hurt. It's like the same for the, you know, the job seeker. It's like, you know what, like maybe you need to go look at your resume. Maybe you need interview practice. Maybe you just need to apply for another job. Maybe it's more interviews, you need to, whatever it may be, but like letting, letting that like mental stress, anguish, that beat down beat you. Like that's the only time you lose is when you kind of like start pointing the finger elsewhere and go, I'm not the problem anymore. And you know, it's the market, it's inflation, it's the recession, it's COVID, like all those things are true, but then, you know, there are people that can beat it. And, you know, if someone's in that situation right now, I just hope they take that mindset and, and kind of try to flip it on their head and, and kick whatever their problem is, but <laughs> Yeah, you know what, you, you, you hit it spot on. And uh, you know what, I will take physical pain any day over emotional pain. Yeah, uh, I think most of us would agree with that. And, and the other pieces, you know what, and, and I love that you said this is, I may not be doing it, but someone else did. And so if it's possible for them why would I not find out what would make it possible for me? Right. And, and you know what? That's, 
that's really it. It's like, don't be willing to stop with the can't. Always work towards understanding what will allow you to can. Like, yeah. you know, it's easy to say you can't. It's easy to blame and it's easy to find excuse. But you know what? Finding reason and, and finding success and everything can become just as easy. The more you practice something, the easier it becomes. Totally. It's awesome. Jordan, thanks so much for, uh, for joining me. I know you've got another meeting to get to that I've probably made you two minutes late to, but uh, yeah, love the fact that you joined us. I look forward to connecting again. I'm sure we will. One of the things Jordan talked about is maybe having a, uh, a reoccurring session of some sort, putting some, some posts up or some discussion around, uh, you know, like trying to create more conversation about inclusivity and accommodating and, and things of that nature. So we'll definitely look at getting something like that together. Of course, we'll, we'll put links up for, for Jordan and some other resources, but if anyone wants to reach out, obviously we'll have his, his links in our, uh, in our posts as they go. And yeah, Jordan, obviously uh, if there's anything else you want to share, we'll make sure it's linked up there. And again, thanks for, uh, thanks for taking the time. Yeah. And, and thank you, Brent, for, for seeing everyone not just seeing those that reach out to you, seeing those that don't reach out to you. And thank you for having these conversations. This is exactly how we're all going to end up in a better place. So I appreciate it. I thank you for it. And I, I challenge everyone to go through the, the same thought process as you are and how you do things and how you present yourself to people. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks, Jordan. Have a great day. Okay, we'll talk soon. All right, bye. Bye-bye.